The title of this show is Framing Reality, the Role of Propaganda. And I have two very good people here who I claim as my children, so this is Take Your Children to Work Week. <laughs> and I'm, I'm having them to talk to you about this subject because they will know far more about it than I do, which makes me very happy that they are my guests. And I'll start with Hunter Haviland Adams III, and then I will go to Dr. Joseph Ben Levy, and I will start with Hunter only because it was Hunter's idea that we get into this. So I'm going to say that I want Hunter to, I know he has an opening statement he wants to make, but somewhere in this opening statement, Hunter, I want you to include an excerpt that you have from your upcoming book, We Were Never Slaves. And that excerpt has to do about the stories, the five stories or the four mm -hmm. stories. So if you would please refer to that, because I think for me, propaganda is about propagation. And propagation is the widespread uh, distribution of false information. You know, well, for me it is, you know, it, it, it's not a pejorative term in just that sense. You can propagate something that is actually true. But the, the, the theory that about the, all, most of the theories about African people promulgated by non-African people have been in error and they have been purposefully done. And consequently, I think of propaganda always in the negative. So I want you to talk about the stories that other people tell about us, as well as the stories that we tell about ourselves and to ourselves as you somewhere over in your presentation. Now I will stand down. <laughs> oh, thank you so very much for having me as a guest on your show again. I'm always delighted uh, to be here and, and offer some contribution um, to your listeners um, that we, we have to really pay attention to things. Um, and you talk about stories, um, the idea of, <coughs> of stories is really crucial because whoever tells your story, that's going to be how you live your life. So you have to ask yourself, who's telling your story and why? It's, it's, it's so important because if someone can tell your story about you, about your history, then they have, the, they have control over your future. It, it doesn't seem, does that seem reasonable? Well, mm. some will say no. But here's the thing. The movie Black Panther by Ryan Coogler, who directed it, it told a different story of African people that before that we had never seen before. Mm. Because our stories always reference what I call a rogue reality, mm. that a reality where African people are always depicted miserable, dejected, disenfranchised, depressed, decadent, <laughs> all the D words, and there's many more, mm -hmm. right? But his film didn't show African people as that at all, right? You didn't see African people colonized. Mm -hmm. You didn't see African people as, quote, captives, which some people say slaves. Mm -hmm. You didn't see African people who were um, um, subservient to someone else in that they had their own, these five ethnic groups in the, in the film, Black Panther, had their own economies. Mm -hmm. They were trading amongst themselves right they didn't need to trade with anyone else they knew the other world existed but they were doing fine by themselves mm -hmm. their idea of their history of their origin story was not reference to anyone else not reference to europeans not reference to arabs not reference to asians 
They had their own origin story, which was talked about in that opening montage of about six minutes. And they said a meteorite hit Africa and then you see five hands come out the sand, locked. They were together. So what did that say? It reset time. It said African people were the first people. But that's not the story that we get. Mm -hmm. We get a story told by someone else about us where our history, our humanity has been erased or it's been covered up or misused, abused. Now people will say our history is fake news mm -hmm. because Hegel said Africans didn't have any history, mm -hmm. right? To, to um, didn't have any history at all. Mm -hmm. We had never contributed anything to humanity. How can that be? Mm -hmm. You have the chief Supreme Court Justice, Roger Taney, mm -hmm. in the Dred Scott decision, mm -hmm. make a claim without evidence that these blacks are beings of an inferior order. Without evidence. And that statement has never been annulled, overruled, or challenged yet. It's still United States law that African people, black people, descendants of the captives today, are beings of an inferior order. Hmm. And they were never meant to be a part of this political experiment. Mm -hmm. That's someone else's story. The guy made an assertion without evidence. It was an opinion, just like the totality of what the Dred Scott versus Sanford uh, case was, was an opinion. Mm -hmm. But it's never been challenged. And so we're still looked at today where we've been framed, Dr. Peace, as being less than human. Mm -hmm. It's in the Bible. Slaves, Ephesians, slaves obey your masters. But that story was changed too. Because, I talk about this in the book, the, the new politicals, Jefferson, Madison, Adams, and so forth, they wanted to print their own Bibles, mm -hmm. the King James Bible here. But George III says, no, you must buy your Bibles from me. Mm -hmm. This is the expert here, Dr. Levy. He can correct me if I'm wrong. No, no, no. Right? No, no, because Jefferson made his own Bible. Right? Mm -hmm. And so when they, after 1789, when the Constitution was ratified, they said, bump you, King. Mm -hmm. We're going to print our own Bibles. It'll be the King James Authorized Version but it's been Americanized and a hundred verses have been mistranslated. Mm -hmm. They've been mistranslated mm -hmm. from, oh, Moses parted the Red Sea. It was the Reed Sea. Right. It wasn't red, it was the Reed Sea. <laughs> right. It was a sea of reeds, mm -hmm. so you could just walk through there. And so we've been susceptible to this propaganda, right? Statements that are made or assertions that are made without a factual basis. Former presidential candidate Herman Cain, the pizza man, he said, he was honest, I don't have facts to back this up. <laughs> mm -hmm. But he said it anyway. And so that's what we get. We get all these assertions mm -hmm. about us. They're wrong stories. There's someone else telling our story. So we have to tell our own stories. I say that we were never slaves. That's the title of my book. We should never, ever use that term to refer to our ancestors. They were captives, mm -hmm. prisoners of war. And even the Spanish and the Portuguese said so themselves. Mm -hmm. They were, these Africans were ransom captives. Mm -hmm. They were kidnapped, stolen, 
and held for ransom until somebody paid the ransom, hmm. whoever that might have been, whether some wealthy family in Lisbon or wherever, they had to pay the ransom. Hmm. The word slave was invented. It's a trick. Mm -hmm. It really referred to Slav. Mm -hmm. We talked about this before. But they put a diacritical mark over the A, right, to change the pronunciation. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And since people didn't know what that meant, they put an E on the end, the British did, to make it slave. Mm -hmm. So you would know that this is differentiating Eastern European Slavic people from Africans mm -hmm. because Slavs for a number of centuries, uh, maybe 12th through the 16th century, they were the ones who were being abducted mm -hmm. in the Holy Roman Empire. They were outside of the Ro Roman Empire, but, and I got this on the authority from a Czech when I had a dinner at the Czech Council in Chicago. He gave me the whole history. Blew me away. Mm -hmm. Even people say, oh, we weren't slaves, we were enslaved. Mm -hmm. Well, enslaved comes from enclave mm -hmm. or enclave. Mm -hmm. Clavis. Yes, clavis. Right? Meaning you're under lockdown. <laughs> <laughs> and so <laughs> the Slavic people were on lockdown by the Holy Roman Emperor. Mm -hmm. Otto. Right, they were, in, they were prisoners of war in their own land. So we got all this wrong, Dr. Peace. Mm -hmm. Can you help me out? Can <laughs> well, we get this straight? We're here to try to get some propaganda examined and we're gonna get Ben Levy to hold it down for another minute and a half. <laughs> okay, uh, well. Good opening I, I, though, honey. Yes, sure was. Because my approach to it is going to be very close to his in that one of the biggest uh, examples of propaganda that we've dealt with over the years is the idea of the coming apocalypse. The idea that this thousand year reign of, uh, of Christ is going to occur and afterwards uh, there's going to be this rapture and, and there's going to be a thousand years of peace and all this. And, and what's really interesting is that the, the Pew Research Center just did a study showing that uh, most Americans, i.e. white Americans, are moving away from the church. But black people are coming more and more and more to it. And Oftentimes, if they're, if they're failing to realize that, one, uh, way back when in the, um, oh, this was about uh, the um, uh, 16th century, that was this uh, Benedictine nun. Her name was uh, Hildegard mm -hmm. uh, Bergen. Hildegard was arguing, arguing that the, the problem, the notion of apocalypse, the problem of the so-called Antichrist was really the church. Now, the problem with the idea of the Antichrist, or the Antichristo, that is, the one who is against the anointed, what that idea really comes from is the fact that in the early development of uh, the church, when they were debating over text, because we've got to remember that uh, the, the, the early New Testament, the earliest one, the Muratonian uh, 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 canon, only had Mark and the letters of Paul in it. That was it. It didn't have all the stuff we had. It wasn't until three roughly, uh, th you know, 364 uh, uh, or so when uh, uh, Bishop Athanasius of Alexandria comes out and does his Easter speech that they lay out the 27 books that are in there now and nobody ever questioned it. But what they were also doing was suppressing another story. That's right. The other story, which is told by the people that they refer to as the Gnostics, now they have many different names, the, the, the Valentians, the, the, the uh, people who follow Basilides and a whole group of these people, they were arguing that first off, there was no such thing as a Jesus. That this person they call Jesus, who is really called Yeshua, you know, we, we think about, about this term Yeshua as if it was a unique name. But Yeshua was as easy as, as finding my name Joseph out there. There were thousands of people with that name. If you were to stand in the, uh, uh, in, in the uh, uh, forum and holler out, hey, Jesus, Hell, it probably been about 300 people who stood up and said, are you talking to me? Not only that, 
the notion that uh, uh, he was born of Joseph. See, this is a different story because originally it says that Mark says he was born of Mary. Well, technically in that part of the world at the time, you couldn't say that a man was born of a woman because that meant that he didn't have a father. That was really, really problematic. But people have believed, really going back to uh, uh, roughly oh, um, uh, 999 or so, that the, this apocalypse was going to occur in the year 1000. When it didn't happen, they changed the story. <laughs> and one of the ways that they changed the story is that they, one, changed the date, but then that was problematic because no one knew what that date was. And when Dionysius Exiguus, uh, who was a, a, a Cilician monk, came up with the idea of what we think of as BCAD, because he did that, uh, he was some four to six years off. And see, most people don't think about the fact that while we call this the year 2018, when was year one and for whom? Hmm. Because there were other calendars that people were following. And so, if we were to accept the fact that the way that he constructed the calendar was four to six years off, then this is really not the year 2018, is it? There are many, many, many times when we had these problems of uh, these apocalyptic dates. Um, when when uh, we look at, say, the year 1099, that was a very important date. They thought that the apocalypse was going to happen then, the Norman invasion. Mm -hmm. It didn't. When uh, um, Octavian, who became Augustus Caesar, defeated um, um, Marcus, uh, 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 Marcus Antonius and Cleopatra at the Battle of Actium and unified the kingdom, what became known as the Pax Romana, uh, he was given the title Soter. Soter in Greek means savior because there was peace throughout the world. Now, Suetonius, Plutarch, Tacitus, uh, many of these ancient writers all talked about the importance of saviors at their time. This was before Jesus was even thought of coming come into the existence. You also had uh, uh, people uh, like uh, 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 um, uh, uh, Apollonius of, uh, uh, of Tyana, all right? Now this individual had all of the characteristics of um, and Philostratus wrote about this, of all the characteristics that we typically describe, uh, ascribe to Jesus. And he was on record as having done this. We have no records of this so-called Jesus performing all these miracles and stuff. On top of that, the people where he lived in Galilee, which was to be like from the hood, if you come from Galilee, I mean, that was the worst place to come from. <laughs> uh, most of the people of that time didn't believe him. See, the way the story got to make him be believed to be the Messiah and all this kind of stuff was something that was created much, much later when the texts were worked out. And we don't see this occurring until roughly uh, 336 when uh, Constantine, this is after the Council of Nicaea in 325, mm -hmm. right, where they actually established this individual Jesus as the Son of God and all this kind of stuff and having the same substance as God. They decide then and he puts out an edict to go out and find all of the other material that is written contrary, anti-Christ, and having it burned. Not only that, to have the people who wrote them destroyed, to have them killed. So you have pe powerful people like Arius. Arius was one of the people who was uh, one of the African bishops at the Council of Nicaea who made the argument that it is impossible for God to be considered a man or to be like a man. But the, 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 the powers in the church at that time made the argument, mm -hmm. well, we're going to make it like this. And they argued over a Greek word, homosia. You know, the same, you know, a man's substance, homo man, usia, substance. Mm -hmm. And what they did was they put an iota in the word 
homo oi usia to mean like the same substance as God. And so consequently, uh, that's, that's in, they, they established what they called the Nicene Creed at that time. And from that day forward, this uh, 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 individual became uh, a superhero. You know, he was like this God-like being, even though throughout the world at that time, there were many, many, many savior type deities. This is why when Paul goes to all these people and tell them about this, this uh, special person with, uh, who was, had these God-like figures, they could relate to that. They all had these type of special gods who were born of virgins, who were died and mm -hmm. were resurrected. They knew they were familiar, but they were, they, they, they were good with that. But what he did was brought in a new kind of idea. So that carried on for a long time. Now, let me run this up to them, bring it up to the United States. When we come to the United States, when you get people like uh, Cotton Mather uh, in the early days, and, uh, uh, and particularly William Miller, I want to take him because he's the foundation of a lot of this stuff that we call the evangelical movement. Mm -hmm. so they didn't have any evangelicals back then. Uh, Cod, uh, 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 William Miller uh, believed in this notion of dispensationalism. Dispensationalism is the idea that the world has gone through seven different dispensations or seven different time periods. And the last time period was going to happen about 1833. And so he had sat around and, and, and made all these calculations and predicted that this day was going to come when Jesus was going to return. And people were selling off their stuff, dressing in white, sitting up on the mountain, waiting for Jesus to return. Guess what? It didn't happen. So he said, I must have gotten it all wrong. So he went back and recalculated and said it would be the next year, 1834. Uh, Nothing happened. And so then they just, they, there was a big split. And that split uh, turned into the Jehovah's Witnesses and the Seventh-day Adventists. You know, the word Advent uh, means or to, to uh, uh, like a returning, a, a returning arrival. They, they translated it, it to mean the return of Jesus Christ. It's just like the Greek word parousia. Parousia mm -hmm. means arrival to return. They made that mean the arrival of Jesus Christ. Now, that's not what it says, but that's how they work with words, right? Right. And so uh, uh, people after that were a little discouraged. But then around 1899, see all the 99 years are very important. 1899, people started then again predicting that this uh, world changing event would occur and the Civil War was a part of the apocalyptic movement toward that. Well, that didn't happen. So 1900 occurred, everything was fine. And then we started getting Lots and lots and lots and lots of stories about the possibility of the world coming to an end, and particularly 1948. Now in 1948, uh, some people who were off in Europe, who were called the Jews, after the Balfour Declaration under Great Britain and the establishment of the Jewish Mandate in Palestine, were allowed to go to a land where they told them this is a land without some people and this is some people without a land. Of course, there were people who were there, Palestinians. For American evangelicals, people like Billy Graham, this was a sign that the end was near because the Jews are returning to the land and now we can get ready for this uh, a great apocalypse that's going to occur. Well, it didn't. And so they started changing the story again. They recalculated. So we had people who were predicting that it was going to happen in 1977. We had people predicting that it was going to happen in uh, uh, 2012, December 21st, 2012, the Mayan calendar, mm -hmm. right? Even though they never asked any Mayan priest what they <laughs> thought about that. And when they asked the Mayan priests about December 21st, 2012, they said that we never heard anything like that. <laughs> but a lot of people made a lot of money off they of it. They made money. A lot of money off of it. And because all over the, the History Channel and the and the, uh, 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 and Discovery Channel, you had these people on there, you know, all these white so-called archaeologists and stuff predicted that they figured out what the Mayan calendar has said. But nobody ever went to the Maya pan in the Yucatan and asked the Mayan priest what they thought about that. You see, and this is again a, a, mm -hmm. a, a propaganda game. 
And then guess what? December 20, I was teaching my class. I told my students, I'll see y'all next week. Because December 21st came and went. And you didn't hear anything else about it. Now, to bring it a little further, 1999. What was the big event then? Which played into the right. uh, Y2K, Y2K, right? Y2K. Predicting that this is going to be, the, this is it. This is the end of the world leading to 2000. You've got to keep in mind now nobody knows what the real date is. And so we've established this particular date. So I remember distinctly that uh, I was working in information systems at the time. I was a network administrator and I had a special project that I got paid a nice piece of money for to go to work at the Tribune Tower to sit in the computer room and watch the clock. That's all I had to do. And I did. And when the clock ticked over, you know, January 1st, 2000, I went up on the roof with everybody else and watched the fireworks and had me some champagne. And the interesting thing about that day, I'll never forget, is that this is December 31st, and it is 65 degrees outside on this day. Nothing happened. All right. Now, what we find is that when these things occur, you find people readjusting the script and starting to say, other types of things, but this has been going on for a long, long time. And what comes out of this is a propaganda machine that boosts the church and boosts, because around these times, membership in churches explode because everybody is hoping that something is going to happen. But what they're not told is that the text itself does not talk about the historical Jesus. And no ministers address the historical Jesus. They can talk about the Christ. The Christ is a theoretical construct. Christ means to be anointed, to have oil poured upon you. There's no something. Jesus' last day wasn't Christ like mine, Joseph Ben Levy. But it's an easy way for them to play the game because you can preach on that. Second, I can always preach on metaphors. And of course you have people out there, I'm sure, that say, well, in the book of Revelations it says this, and in Daniel it says that. Yeah, but if you don't know ancient history, you don't know that the force beasts coming up out of the sea hmm. have nothing to do with what's going on here because there was no America at that time. It wasn't even thought about. But people like to think that when the, the lion comes up and his wings get plucked off, the lion is Great Britain, when the wings get plucked off and they fly over to America, that those are, that's America. You know, you can do anything metaphorically you want with prophecy. You but can. unless you really know the history, and not only that, many prophets are what I like to call Monday morning quarterbacks. All right, they saw the game, and then the next day they have a discussion about it, and about who they thought should have won and how it should have been won and so forth and so on. But they are not really uh, speaking to the actual event that occurs. And this is one of the problems that we have. And I'm not saying there aren't things in the Bible that aren't really historical. One of the really fundamental historical things, and then I'm going to be quiet let, let Hunter jump into this, is this. Hezekiah, and this goes to Isaiah and to Matthew, when Matthew says a virgin shall conceive seed and bear a son and call his name Emmanuel, quoting from uh, 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 Isaiah 7.14. Well, the Greek word parthena, parthenos, which means virgin, is not in Isaiah. The Hebrew word for, for virgin is betula. It doesn't say, and, and in there it says alma, it means a young woman. And when they're reading that, they're just taking that one passage, but they're not going up to the top and reading where the, uh, the, the prophet Isaiah is speaking to, uh, uh, to Ahaz uh, and to uh, uh, and telling him about Romalia uh, and, and Peck and all these people who are going to come in and create these problems. I mean, you should read that in the book of 2 Kings, in the, roughly the 14th chapter and so forth, where Aha, I mean, Hezekiah shows up. I mean, Isaiah shows up and is talking to Ahaz, who has a son whose name is Hezekiah. And in it, it says, and God was with him. That's what the word in Hebrew, Emmanuel, means. And God was with him. And so what they did was apply that to Jesus just snatched it out and applied it to him, but it had nothing at all to do with Jesus, but they were making a story. And again, propaganda at work. Well, here's what. What we got going right now is the greatest story ever told spiritually and the greatest story ever told historically and 
a combination of both. Mm -hmm. So are we talking about rival stories? Is, is, the, is the notion that African people were slaves rather than captives the greatest story ever told? Or was the notion that Jesus was the Savior God instead of one of the 16 crucified saviors? Yeah, are Dr. they rival Jackson stories? Are they companion stories? Are they all part of the same propaganda machine that churns out theories and then spreads them to frame reality and give us a false sense of the composition of the world and of ourselves as a people. Yeah. Well, I well, need well, Hunter. Right, well, all right, go ahead. Somebody. No, I'm just, yeah. saying, just saying, you, you brought up the other stories that were uh, well, censored, uh, mm -hmm. right, during that time. Yes. And so, one from the Nag Hammadi text yes. found 1945 and yes, 1947 in Egypt, mm -hmm. Kemet, right, yes. where they put the, their scrolls in some jars and buried them. But who would have thought almost 2,000 years later they would turn up by accident? Mm -hmm. And in the Gospel of Thomas, yes. mm -hmm. right? Yep. Which is not in the King James of course Version not. of the Bible. Of course, of course so not. Right. Because it has a different idea of divinity. Right. That the kingdom is within you. Right. Even um, our good friend, um, Miss Dorothy Tillman, on the radio said Saturday that God is in the brain and the mind. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. Mm -hmm. And so that was the story. But but that story was censured. Mm -hmm. It was censured. You can't. God has to be outside of everything. But how can that be? How can, quote, this deity, this creator be outside of his creation or its creation? I would raise the question, how can God be outside and not inside if God At is the same omnipresent? Time. Yes, yes. If God is omnipresent, then he is equally present. Everywhere. I don't even like the pronoun he. Mm -hmm. But if God is omnipresent, God is equally present everywhere. Ah, that but Dr. Peace, we have to be careful with that term, oh, right. God, mm -hmm. right? Well, because I, it I comes understand from that God right. is, a, is a common right. noun. Right. It's part of a classification of a group. So you haven't really said anything because if you have not... But it's a German word. If, it, if you don't give it a name, you know, if, it, if I run, walk, walk out into the schoolyard and say, boy, then everything that thinks it's male out there is going to respond to that. So if you walked out into uh, a situation and said, God, everything that thinks it's God is going to respond to that. So if you do not, if you cannot identify and name, then you do not have a concept of a divinity. You just have a concept of a group which you have admitted by using the term God that you don't know anybody in it. Yeah, yeah here's the point. When, when, when he mentions Nag Hammadi, two things. One, in the Gospel of Thomas, it is true. Now, in, in the Coptic, and it's written, these texts are written in Coptic, in Coptic, the term for kingdom is, is a feminine term. And one of the more powerful texts in Nag Hammadi is Thunder Perfect Mind, which is all about, all about the feminine nature of deity as feminine. Now, one of my things, there's an excellent book, uh, uh, Merlin Stone, uh, uh, When God Was a Woman. Right. I always like to point out to my students, when did God, when we use that term, become a man? When in most ancient cultures, even among certain early European cultures, they understood the nature that there was a direct re relationship between reproduction from the earth and women. That's why in most right. African societies, guess who went out and did the farming? Right. Women did. And, and many of those men who were brought here as captives were offended to have to go out into the fields and plant because they believe that's women's work. And I think that that's a real problem. 
that we and most people don't want to talk about the fact that even no, this individual Jesus, guess who his number one supporters were? All women. All women, nobody likes to see because they like to pick and choose what they want to talk about, right? Instead of looking at the whole thing in context. They were all women. All those women supported him. You know, he was big pimping, as they like to say today. All right. <laughs> well, he was. All right. Well, now you got to you got to decide whether or not you're going to have an historical Jesus, which we have not yet found. Uh -huh. Or you're going to have a biblical Jesus in which you then have a person who is supported by women. Mm -hmm. So now you you have to decide on whether or not that's going to be a, be true for you as well. But the whole point is that these stories and opinions have had such a devastating influence on us because they obscure the truth. Mm -hmm. And when, when, when reality is obscured so that you do not know who you are, where you are, what your purpose is, what your destiny is, then how do you function in truth? Mm -hmm. How do you function in terms of your purpose to know yourself, to know thyself? How does one get to know thyself when a false sense of thyself is presented? Mm -hmm. Always before you, a mirror image of yourself has there's when you go to look in the mirror there's already an image in it mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right you mm -hmm. never see yourself right. because there's always there's an image already there that's by intent that's intentional mm -hmm. so come on yeah it's um we we have to really learn language mm -hmm. right and how language can manipulate us Stephen uh, K. Dick, you know, the great science fiction writer, he talks about how words can manipulate our consciousness and have us believing things when there's no factual basis for them. And so we have to pay very close attention to language. Mm -hmm. Like when someone says um, um, that when we think of black and Dr. King said this that we had to get the language straight mm -hmm. when we think black we th we call up negative associations in our consciousness in our semantic networks because the language does it because mm -hmm. that's the language right. yes when we think white it calls up positive associations whether you believe it or not you don't have to believe in white supremacy but when you say white supremacy, for example, the corollary of that is what? Black, Black, Black inferiority. inferiority. Absolutely. Even though, so you're still privileging whiteness with the term white supremacy. Mm -hmm. That's why I never use that term. Mm -hmm. and you know, that's interesting because when we, when we go back to, what is it, about uh, 1671 in Virginia when they established right. the law, where they, where they established right. whiteness as a law, right. they did that to juxtapose it against something else. And that something else was an idea of blackness. And their idea of their black. idea of black, right. And, and of course, it also was this opportunity, which we're still dealing with today, and most people don't know because they don't study the origin of ideas, of, of why it is that uh, uh, less uh, 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 well-off people who are classified as white in this country feel such an affinity to elites who are classified as whites in this country in opposition to people who are called blacks in this country because they serve as their middle men, middle functionaries for them. And of course, all this happens after uh, Bacon's Rebellion. Right. You see, Bacon's Rebellion is one of those crucial events in American history that they don't ever like to talk about because it was the, the, the uh, disunifying factor of poor and so-called working class people as they like to use in this country against elites. And the people are still doing the same thing they talk to him. I mean, it amazes me how uh, 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 45 gets into his thing, and I don't want to go in him right now because he ain't a part of this, the, the, he's not the, the uh, 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 number one subject of this, but he's a part of the discussion because it's about propaganda. Right. All right? But 
Uh, here's what I wanted to point out to you right quick is that when you look at the, the thinking of the founders, or as Francis, Dr. Francis Creswell, the late Dr. Francis Creswell used to refer to them as the fondlers, and you read their documents, they were deist. See, the notion that the United States was supposed to be a Christian country is false. And it's never been stated. Never. Because they were deists. Many of these people were Masons. They came out of that whole uh, uh, Enlightenment movement that, uh, was that really is the foundation of what they call the Illuminati. I always like to tell my students, Illuminati means you're the enlightened ones compared to those who are not enlightened. That's right. And the truth of the matter is that these individuals were living on the idea of reason. And when you read the, the Declaration of Independence correctly, they clearly state that they refer to a creator. They don't refer to Jesus or to God, to a creator. This is very, very common Masonic lot, uh, a language right. that is very important, you know, and how you want to do it. They were not interested in having any kind of religious uh, 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 representation or authority in this country. That was not their program. But because people don't read those documents correctly or understand the background behind right. them or the people behind them. When you're looking at even the people like Thomas Paine and Thomas Young and some of these other individuals and read their writings. Uh, they're not trying to push a Christian idea, but see people who don't read and most people don't read, don't read. It's the people who, it's like people who, I always tell uh, 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 my students all the time that uh, you know people still looking at pictures in the Bible. They don't read it. You know, they're looking at the pictures or they'll look at the Ten Commandments and say, that's just how I went down. But then they don't study. See, uh -huh. reading is one thing. Studying is yes. another. When you when you look and you say, well, when do they get semicolons? Mm. You know, I mean, back ages ago, they had pu this punctuation. Right. You know, they had colons and semicolons and commas right. and all of this. And if you move punctuations around, you can get an entirely, entirely different, meaning. different meaning. meaning. Once, once I embarked upon that, but it just was taking too much time. But I embarked upon that, you know, putting a period here, taking a comma out there and letting it continue. It, it's, it, it's amazing how just, if you talk about language and changing words and changing the meaning if you if you you would be amazed at how inserting punctuation yes. in places alters entirely what a group of words would say yes so you you've got a problem with the language you have a problem with the culture you have a problem with the concepts that grow out of both of those mm -hmm. and here we are captive people who were never slaves but who are behaving very much like it because I think probably after if you get called out of your name so long I, I look at the the indigenous people of this country and I look at them call themselves Indians now it amazes me right. because I couldn't mm -hmm. imagine they never call themselves that right when they were the original Potawatomi, people, right. Miami, right, right. Lakota, right. They, right. they had, they were the Choctaw, you know, all they were the that. Algonquins, right. they were the Blackfoot, they were all the other Navajos, they were people mm -hmm. with names, and now they are Indians. Right, right, right. Well, you know, that when you get, when you, I think the generations that are not taught by their elders, that are separated yes. and, and, and educated outside of the community, now, because they didn't get that connection, now see themselves as Indians and Native Americans. Mm -hmm. This was not even mm -hmm. America. True. Even when you take um, uh, Haiti, for example. Mm -hmm. uh, we got five minutes, so we gonna take Haiti real okay, quick. Okay, this will be, less than one minute. Um, they did, you had the French Revolution around the same time. Yes. You had the quote American Revolution at the same time. But it was only Haiti's 1805 Constitution mm -hmm. that banned quote slavery yes. and criminalized anyone who participated in that. They had a different notion of human rights. Mm -hmm. Right, and so we have. They had a different notion of humans. Yes, 
Exactly. And we that's what we have to get back to. Mm -hmm. Right. Group. I agree. And, and so I would mm -hmm. ask your readers, please get this book here. It's called How Propaganda Works by Jason Stanley. He's at Yale University. It's a very powerful book that gives you the inner workings of how we're manipulated and tricked. Mm -hmm. Well, I can tell you one thing. Yes. We are an example of how propaganda works. Yes. Mm -hmm. Because when you have become fictitious, when you have become so unlike yourself that you, as I say, when you look in the mirror, you do not know that that is not yourself in that mirror, that there, that is somebody, that the man in the mirror is not you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So yeah. want, I, I, propaganda I, 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 has, is, is alive and well it's working and well. working in America. Yes, it is. I would say that uh, two things. One, uh, whenever you look at uh, a, a text of a non commodity text or the early biblical text in Greek or Hebrew, there is no punctuation. These, these ideas of medu verses, and, yeah, medu Chinese. And Chinese, oh, there is no punctuation. Mm -hmm. And so uh, these ideas of verses and chapters and all this stuff, this all stuff comes up in the Middle Ages. And so just like Hunter, I want to uh, encourage your audience if they want to get some good ideas. This is a history of the end of the world by uh, Jonathan Kirsch, how the most controversial book in the Bible changed the course of Western civilization. And this one is called Longing for the End. Uh, by Friedrich J. Baumgartner, which is, which is a history of millennialism and Western civilization. These are both excellent books on the history of that. And I have many more, but I just wanted to drop these right here. Well, that in, order to, worth in order to read books, you have to give up something else. Mm -hmm. So I hope they don't give up the H3O show <laughs> <laughs> that brought you this message. But I thank you very much. Thank you Hunter, for having me. Thank, thank, thank you always. Adams III and Dr. Joseph Ben Levy, who I still claim, even though you all do sometimes get um, go off on your own and do stuff that you didn't ask my permission to do. <laughs> <laughs> I thank you very much, Dr. Peace. Okay. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you so much. I love you. Yeah. Uh, you are so funny sometimes. I'm telling you, man. Once upon a Surely we had tribes, but we all lived right there in Africa. When things began to change, there were forces that divided us. Spread throughout the world, we seem unsure about our heritage.